Um, I'm a physician, pediatrician doing bone marrow transplants in children um, normally. And then I'm a postdoc since about a year back here. And uh, I was asked to give a talk, sort of an <coughs> overview about some mass cytometry projects going on in the Davis lab, because you've heard a lot from the Nolan lab, and uh, we're doing slightly different things, although we're collaborating on a lot of things as well. And um, there's a lot of different projects going on in the Davis lab involving mass cytometry, uh, large systems immunology analysis of big cohorts, where we use uh, Cytoff as, as one tool. Um, I've been doing a twin study in over 200 twins where we're looking at all different aspects of the immune system in the blood. But I will not talk about those broad studies. Instead, I will talk about more focused T-cell projects that we have going on. And they're not all my projects. I will, refer to, I will tell you who's responsible for some of the other things. That, um, and yeah, it's all about trying to understand the phenotypes, the functions, and the different specificities within the T-cell population, uh, which is very diverse as we come to learn. So I will talk about how we mine the phenotypic space, meaning the, all the different phenotypes we find in mice and humans. And we compare also mice and humans, uh, which we see as an important thing to do because of all the studies that have been done in the mice in the past. And uh, we want to know which of those can be translated into humans. So uh, the functional diversity of T cell I will touch upon because that's another, um, it's something that is becoming possible when we're using Cytoff with all the increased numbers of parameters. Antigen specificity is, um, and the specific T cells, is something that is sort of uh, a focus of the lab since many years. And applying this to mass cytometry has been a, a key um, uh, goal for the lab in the last few years. And it's been, it's been successful now. And we're, I will tell you a little bit about what we're finding when we're doing that. And, and also when we again with the increased number of parameters using Cytoff, we can combine uh, reagents in a combinatorial way to study much, much broader immune responses in terms of antigen-specific T cells. So this uh, beautiful German slide from 1964 just shows how cells could, you know, were, were defined, cell types were defined in, in that age with uh, microscopy and these beautiful images, and then uh, with the development of flow, cytometry, and monoclonal antibodies, etc., we started to create these trees of subpopulations. In this case, mouse T cells with the uh, CD4s and CD8s and the uh, uh, memory, memory subsets, naive central memory, effector memory, and effector cells. And um, when we then take these definitions and we include these markers, but also add all the other markers that have been implied to be expressed on different subpopulations of T cells. And then we just, uh, in sort of an unbiased way, reduce dimensionality, in this case using a principal component analysis. Uh, SPADE would be another tool to use something to do, um, which we also use. But in this case, a principal component analysis that reduces these, we're starting out with 43 parameters, but then getting down on, in this case, CD8 T cells, we use up a few of those parameters, and we have about 36 left here for this. Um, and then what we find is that instead of these distinct tree of uh, effector cells, naive cells, effect central memory, etc., we see more of a continuum where the naive cells in light blue, they're uh, sort of... Uh, is intertwined with the other ones, effector memory in the middle and the central memory as the most phenotypically sort of distinct from the naive ones. And uh, this is just one example of how we're mining the diversity in the T cell population and sort of exploratory analysis. And obviously we're doing a bunch of follow-up studies to try to figure out what determines this uh, sort of progression in phenotypic uh, variance, um, what um, does this have any functional implications that these cells are not actually so as distinct as we believed before, that they might be more similar? Is it so that there's a bunch of intermediate states in between all these previously believed to be distinct states? And we, we think that that's true, and, and we're following up on all of this. And, and this uh, particular finding it was probably not so surprising because it's been proposed by others that there's a lineage relationship between these mouse T-cell subpopulations where cells actually go from naive 
to um, effector memory and then through central memory. So that particular finding was not uh, all that unexpected, but we have other findings that are much more so. And um, I will not go into all the details of the data that is still unpublished and, and that we're still working intensely on trying to understand, but this is a PCA, <coughs> simple, same principle component analysis. We reduce the number of dimensions in this case to five, and then we show them one by one, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And we find this bimodal distribution in principal component number two, suggesting that um, this T cell population is split in half, uh, as defined by this component. And when we do more of these type of analysis, we see in this case, for example, that all these different memory subpopulations are distributed in these two halves, if you will, of the T-cell system, T-cell population. So um, I will not go into all of this, as I said, the details of this, but this just shows you one example of how we can find things that we did not know before. And obviously, this split in the whole T-cell population, including all the different memory populations, is not defined by one marker, because then it would probably have been described many years ago. But it is instead defined, it is explained by small changes in many markers combined that put cells in one of these two halves. And so we're, we're obviously working on figuring out um, the mechanisms of why this, what the functional implications of having a T cell population that is split in half and etc. Um, but I will not go into all the details of that. Instead I will move on to this other tree which is from a paper by Holden um, showing the T cells populations in humans and as I said before we have an interest in comparing mouse and humans and the memory markers used in the different species, uh, species are different. Um, even though the molecules are conserved. So we're interested in trying to figure out is there this progression I showed earlier, is that the same for mouse and humans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So are the T cell population globally in mouse, mice and humans uh, similar? Similarly diverse, etc. So Evan Newell in our lab, who is now in Singapore, published uh, earlier last year a study which, is, which this data is taken from, which shows that when you use such a principal component analysis to reduce the number of dimension and overview the variance in the whole T cell population, we see there's a progression in <coughs> from naive to central memory, effector memory, and then these effector cells as sort of a horseshoe shape, if you will, going towards the right like that. And uh, we asked the question, so how does this look if you take the mouse. Um, we've used the mice, the mice for many, many years to study <coughs> phenomena that we think are important to humans. And when we look at this pattern with the, the definitions of subpopulations that are sort of the commonly used in mice, we see a completely different pattern where the progression is completely different and um, there's not at all that same um, similarities between the different subpopulations. They, they um, in this case, for example, it's not very clear from this image, but like I said before, the effector memory is more similar to the naive than the central one, and it's the opposite in humans. So um, we're mining these differences, trying to figure out like which markers do, uh, are responsible for this. I should tell you that this is a naive mouse and a human, which ha the human has seen a bunch of things during its lifetime, and that's obviously a confounding factor, but also something that might explain this. So just to sum up this part here, that we're, we're looking at the phenotypic space globally using the CITOF um, without any real preconceived ideas of, of which markers belong where, which is do these uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms and uh, analyses, and we, we look at how the variance is distributed. And we find that we go from these distinct subpopulations that have been very well established for many years uh, to something that seemed more like continuous states. Um, and one can start to wonder, how, what is a subpopulation? What is, is, is every cell unique in its expression of proteins, etc.? We, I know that those are issues that uh, many people are thinking about, not only in our group. Uh, yeah, so I've talked about phenotypes so far. Um, just surface proteins, uh, intracellular proteins, etc. But 
Cells also do things when we stimulate them, and in our case, these T cells respond when we cross-link the T cell receptor or give them some chemical like pimeanomycin, we induce responses. So this is from the paper by Evan Newell last year and others, um, showing that when you take the, when you use the power of the mass cytometer and actually include many more functional markers in the same sample than you could before with flow cytometry, um, then uh, we find this almost combinatorial pattern of responses that T cells can respond in so many different ways. Um, and we have, in this case, 512 possible combinations of responses, and at least 242 were always found, usually much more than that. So um, showing that there's enormous diversity in the T cell population when it comes to their responses to stimuli. And this is true for many other stimulations as well, but I don't want to go into all of that. <coughs> Just kidding. Um, and then, as I said before, we have this interest in antigen-specific T cells and trying to figure out <coughs> what they do. And, and, and one question that came out of this study or was presented in this study was, if you take cells with the same specificity, T cells responding to flu, EBV, uh, or CMV in this case, are they all the same, those cells that respond to the same virus? Uh, but they're not. So when you stimulate those, you see an equal amount of diversity in their function. So this gives uh, the T cells an enormous flexibility in the way they respond to pathogens because the T cells can respond in so many different ways. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, continue a little bit with what I said earlier about looking at antigen-specific T cells and going into some detail of that. Because one thing that, like I said, we've had an interest in for many years is to study these antigen-specific T cells. And, and for that, in 96, uh, the Davis lab developed these um, <coughs> soluble ligands, MAC multimers, which are the, can be loaded with a peptide from a virus or bacteria or whatever. And then we can specifically bind the T cells that respond to that particular antigen. And a monomer, as shown in the top one, is too uh, unstable. It won't fall off. So that's why we use these tetramer um, constructs. And it was not um, non-trivial to just translate this from flow cytometry to mass cytometry. And this had to do with the metal coupling of the streptavidin. So it took some work. Um, but we now have that working in the lab. And we use that in various ways to study antigen-specific T cells um, using mass cytometry. So I will tell you, this is um, similar to the combinatorial uh, barcoding, etc., that I think you guys have already talked about in the course. Um, here, we can take T cell, these reagents, these tetramers, specific for three different viral proteins, for example, and we can label them with different probes. In this case, it's fluorescent uh, probes, but the same is true for uh, mass-coupled, or metal-coupled um, probes. And so we combine them in this combinatorial fashion. And if we use 10, for example, 10 of these fluorophores, for in this case, mass probes, uh, we can study 1,000, in theory, 1,000 um, different antigen-specific antigen T cell clones. But in more in, in reality, we would like to, uh, we, we, we would need to reduce that a little bit, and I'll tell you why. But let me first say that by using the CITAR for this, we can extend the number of combinatorials that we can study, obviously. But we also have many more markers left to study surface phenoty phenotypes, functional uh, markers, cytokines, signalings, whatever we're interested in. Um, yeah, with the use of the CITAR. So one, um, let's say we wanted to do a 1,000 tetramers. You need to have some kind of high throughput way to, to make those 1,000 different tetramers. It's not something it would take forever if you do it the traditional way. So we're taking advantage of this, uh, this molecule that was developed by Tan Schumacher in Amsterdam, which is uh, an MHC molecule that is produced with an UV cleavable peptide. So we produce the same one, a ton of it almost, and we cleave off the UV peptide and replace it with one of those 1,000 peptides that we want to study. And by doing it in this way, we can easily create a large library of tetramer reagents. 
Um, so this is from a study that is uh, on the way out from our group. And uh, I wanted to sort of talk you through some of the developments that that study presents. Um, and the idea here is, again, let's say you want to vaccinate someone and you want to look at their immune response to the vaccine. You want to be able to look at more than just one of the T cell clones responding to the vaccine, preferably all of them. Um, so one, one thing here was that this was, in, a, in this case, it's a rotavirus a vaccine study, a rotavirus study. And we wanted to predict the viral epitopes from a rotavirus um, vaccine. And that's done by a software that predicts which of all the thousands of different peptides can bind to the MHC of interest. In our case, it's HLA-A2. We get, let's say, 100 candidates. And then you would verify those as true binders or not using an MHC competition assay. We reduce our number slightly more. And then we have our candidate ones that we want to test in our experiments. Then we dedicate three metal probes per such uh, peptide, MHC. And the reason for that is because we want to increase our sensitivity, but we also want to reduce our numbers of false positives um, by looking at cells that are positive for three simultaneous probes. And in this way, in the experiment that was presented in this paper by some of our group members, Evan, Natalia, and others, they took 109 different viral peptides and looked at, this means looking at 109 different T cyclones in the same sample with this combinatorial strategy. And then manually gating on those would be hard. Uh, using spade would not work either because you would really have to find the specific combination of three triple positive cells. So you need some other automatic analysis tool. So we've devised this one, which is an automated uh, identification of these triple positive cells. Basically, the way it works is you set a threshold for the positive in this x uh, dimension, and similarly in the y dimension, because the tetramers should not bind uh, anything else specifically, and they, they usually don't. So you can set this threshold quite accurately. But then you have this slope because you want to be able to find only the cells that are, in this case, double positive, but we do it in three dimensions, so triple positives. And they will, of course, line up like this, rather than just being, let's say, here or here. Um, and then by doing this for all three dimensions, we end up with something like a three-dimensional gate illustrated there. Um, and only the cells that are positive in all three dimensions will be selected as antigen-specific for that particular peptide. So what do we find in these analysis? Well, one of the interesting questions was, so if we do this, we look for 109 different antigen-specific T cells. The cells that respond to the same pathway pathogen, are they similar or unsimilar or, you know, how do they vary? So <coughs> to um, show you an example of that, I'll show you this simple hierarchical clustering of different donors and the uh, cell specific for VP3 or VP6, which are two different epitopes from the rotavirus. And what we find is that with one exception at the top there, all the VP3 specific cells cluster together, meaning that and this is phenotypic markers, meaning that their phenotypes are more similar than the VP6 um, specific cells, which also cluster together. So in different individuals, the cells specific for these particular epitopes of the rotavirus are, end up being similar. Um, and then we took uh, intestinal uh, biopsies and manage to purify T cells out of those and look at the T cells specific for the viral proteins in uh, the intestine, which is where rotavirus acts and where the T cells should be. We found that the VP3 cells could be found in the intestine, but not the VP6 specific ones, and that this difference explain the difference in phenotype between these two different clones. So this is just a small example um, of two antigen-specific T-cell clones out of 109 that we studied 
and there are many more findings like this in that, um, in that study. But just to illustrate that when we combine all these different probes with all these functional markers, we can get a much broader view of an immune response and a T-cell immune response than ever has been possible before. Um, yeah, so I want to kind of sum this up here. So yeah, this, I've already said this really, but we find that these, these different cells differ phenotypically and also functionally, which I didn't show. So um, I think I'll just stop there. I won't have to go further. And I just want to thank, you know, Evan and Natalia did the tetramer stuff at the very end. The HMC Holden and Mike has been very helpful. Serena, others who are here in the room. Nolan Lab, especially Sean with some general Cytoff issues. Uh, Rob and Rachel about analysis issues and normalization. And Matt Spitzer about the mouse. Uh, we talked a lot about the mouse analysis, which is his specialty. So yeah, I can take questions if you guys have any. Otherwise, thank you.